Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. Coming to you from my home in the city I live in, the city of angels, it's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Didn't write that. Just about every year on Bullseye, we bring you a week dedicated to my favorite sport, baseball. We usually try and put it out around opening day. Of course, baseball is very different this year. The season started late, the stadiums are almost empty, and by the time this airs, it's possible that the season will not exist anymore. So, this year's Bullseye Baseball Week is going to be a little different, too. We're going to talk about baseball's history. First up, an interview with Bob Kendrick. Bob is the president of the Negro League Baseball Museum. He's had that job for almost a decade. The NLBM is pretty much the only place in the world dedicated to telling the story of the Negro Leagues. The leagues that gave rise to players like Hank Aaron, Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays, and Satchel Paige. Not to mention, of course, the many players who were never allowed to play Major League Baseball. Bob and I had a really great conversation, so I won't say much more than that because I want to get out of the way, but uh, I'll just say that even if you aren't a fan of baseball, I really encourage you to hear what Bob has to say about this remarkable piece of Americana. Let's listen. Bob, welcome to Bullseye. I'm so grateful to have you on the show. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to join you. Thanks for having me. So, Bob, this is the 100th anniversary of the start of the Negro Leagues, and I want to talk about the Negro Leagues in a minute, but it it occurred to me that I should ask, in what context were African Americans and other dark-skinned people in the United States playing professional baseball before 100 years ago, before 1920? Because professional baseball goes back decades before that. Oh, absolutely. And and African-Americans playing professional baseball goes well before the actual formation of the Negro Leagues here in Kansas City in 1920. Jesse, we've been playing baseball since the late 1800s. And actually, there was some evidence of of African-Americans playing even while being enslaved. So it was certainly not a new phenomena for black folks to play baseball. Unfortunately, it was so haphazard. And booking agents were taking all of the money. So you had all these independent black baseball team owners and it just lacked the organized structure. And and even before the Negro Leagues were formed in Kansas City, there had been some failed efforts to do a structured Negro Leagues. But in 1920, under the brilliance of Andrew Rube Foster, it got the necessary guidance and structure that it needed to succeed. Were there integrated teams before... 1920 at any point? Yeah, there were. There were several instances where blacks had gotten on to what would be considered a major league team. Moses Fleetwood Walker playing for the Toledo team in the late 1800s. Edward White, who was very light-skinned, I'm not sure they knew that he was black, having played on what would be considered a major league team even before Moses Fleetwood Walker, Bud Fowler, guys like that who did integrate teams prior to Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in 1947. But as we like to say, Robinson broke the color barrier in the modern era uh, of Major League Baseball after those players had been banned. And so that's 60 years later that Jackie comes along after Moses Fleetwood Walker and, and breaks the color barrier with the Brooklyn Dodgers. So in the 30 or 40 years before 1920, when professional baseball was being played pretty extensively in the United States, mostly African-American players were playing on kind of wildcat barnstorming teams, teams that would come to town and, and play the team that happened to be there. Yeah, you had a combination of, you know, so you did have these independent black baseball team owners, but the challenge was how do you get games? And so you were basically taking on all comers. And like I said earlier, booking agents, as they were trying to set up games, were taking all of the money. And so it just didn't have the guidance. But yeah, you did have these games going on where barnstorming, even after the formation of the Negro Leagues, was still always a central part 
of the black baseball experience. Major League Baseball did a little barnstorming, but not nearly to the degree in which they did it in the Negro Leagues because the Negro Leagues were just prolific in their barnstorming as they took baseball into Canada and would oftentimes be the first Americans to play in many Spanish-speaking countries. And Jesse, the thing that blows away a lot of the visitors at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is that it was actually a touring team of Negro Leaguers that introduced professional baseball to the Japanese going all the way back to 1927. That's seven years before Babe Ruth and his All-Stars would visit Japan. They have been commonly credited with having taken professional baseball to the Japanese, but it's not true. It was actually a team called the Philadelphia Royal Giants who would go to Japan in 1927, play a 24-game exhibition series. They go 23-0-1 on that tour. The tour was so successful that several years later, Ruth and his All-Stars would get invited over. So yeah, you can see that barnstorming became such a prevalent part. And and really, the, the game, our game, is a global game because of the Negro Leagues. So you mentioned Rube Foster. Rube Foster is a huge figure in Negro Leagues baseball history. Who was he and what was his role in uh, helping to create the Negro Leagues? He was an absolute genius. Yeah, Rube Foster, I think you can make the legitimate case, is the greatest baseball mind this sport has ever seen. And Jesse, people still don't really know who he is, even though he is rightfully enshrined in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He was just light years ahead of his time. So Rube Foster had been a great baseball player himself in the early era of black baseball, prior to the formation of the Negro Leagues. So Rube Foster had been a pitcher, great pitcher. As a matter of fact, he earned his nickname Rube when he beat the great major league pitcher Rube Waddell in a head-to-head matchup. And then Rube Foster is also credited with having invented what we now know to be the screwball. Back then, it was called a fadeaway, and Rube perfected this pitch. So much so that the great Major League manager, John McGraw, would sneak Rube Foster into his camp so that Rube Foster could teach Christy Matheson how to throw the screwball. Well, Christy Matheson threw the pitch all the way into the National Baseball Hall of Fame that he learned from Rube Foster. But Foster was best known as this visionary, this tremendous leader. He would organize and establish the Negro Leagues here in Kansas City in 1920. So for those who sometimes wonder why a Negro Leagues museum is in Kansas City, it's because Kansas City is the birthplace of the Negro Leagues. So Rube Foster leads this contingent of eight independent black baseball team owners into a meeting at the Passell YMCA. Out of that meeting came the birth of the Negro National League, the first successful organized black baseball league. Rube Foster would become the league's president. He owned the Chicago American Giants, and he managed the Chicago American Giants. And Jesse, as a manager, Rube Foster was so shrewd. Rube Foster was known to find his ball players in the early 1900s as much as $5 if you were tagged out standing up you were supposed to slide. Rube would draw a circle down the first baseline and a circle down the third baseline and if every one of his players couldn't drop a bunt inside that circle he would find them he was adamant about the style of play that became signature Negro Leagues baseball. Fast, aggressive, daring. They bunt their way on. They steal second. They steal third. And man, if you weren't too smart, they were stealing home. And, and that, believe it or not, was the style of play that drew both black and white fans who had been segregated in Major League ballparks if black folks were allowed into those Major League ballparks. That for Major League games, they separated by chicken wire. At Negro League games, we sat side by side, watching truthfully the best baseball being played in this country without question the most entertaining brand of baseball being played in this country. And so Foster's brilliance led the Negro Leagues to its early heyday. Where did these teams, especially in the early days of the league and eventually leagues, play? 
Well, you know, interesting enough, they were using a lot of major league stadiums. And, and I think that's part of the reason why the early efforts to do a Negro Leagues failed, because they did not have enough access to stadiums. And, and so when fundamentally, I think the two, the biggest thing that separated Major League Baseball and Negro Leagues Baseball was funding. All the Major League owners had their own stadiums. The Negro Leagues didn't. And, and so there were only a handful of Negro League teams that ultimately had their own stadiums. Uh huh. But by and large, they were renting the ballparks from their Major League counterparts, which is one of the reasons why it took so long to integrate the game. Because... The Yankees were in no hurry to see integration because the Negro Leagues were renting the ballpark from them. They were getting you know, a percentage of the gate and likely all of the concession. The same thing could be said in other cities across the country. And so that had as much of an impact in uh, why it took so long to integrate as anything because uh, many of these major league teams were making money off the Negro Leagues. I mean, it speaks to the legacy of systemic racism that you know, one of the greatest differences between these two parallel sets of leagues was that the the white major leagues had access to capital, be it through inheritance, uh, businesses, or loans, to acquire real estate and develop it, and then you know, use use that power to extract rent from the African American parallel league. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> that whole aspect has always been a part of the African-American plight in this country. And so while these African-American businessmen were certainly shrewd enough to be able to generate capital to put these teams together, they still had to turn to Major League Baseball in order to have the kinds of places that they needed to play these games. And so when I hear people say, well, you know, the Negro League schedule was so haphazard, no, not really. They just had to wait until Major League Baseball set its schedule so that they could see where the open dates were because they were lo using so many of, the, of their stadiums. How many people were going to Negro Leagues games? Man, they're filling up the ballparks. Matter of fact, in many cities across this great country of ours, they, the Negro League teams were outdrawing many major league teams. And so here in Kansas City, the Kansas City, great Kansas City Monarchs played at, at that time, Muehlbach Field and then eventually Municipal Stadium. The stadium, before they put on the upper deck for football, held about 17,000. Well, when the Monarchs played there, Jesse, 17,000 plus standing room only. Well, when they go to Yankee Stadium, they're putting 40,000 in Yankee Stadium. At Comiskey on the south side of Chicago, they've got 50-plus thousand in for the Negro League's version of the All-Star Game, the East-West Classic. So they were filling up these ballparks in Washington, D.C., home of then the Washington Senators. Clark Griffith was watching the Homestead Grades outdraw his Washington Senators. Which, again, is one of the reasons why he had tinkered with the notion of signing Buck Leonard and Josh Gibson well before Branch Rickey made the move to sign Jackie Robinson. But, again, he's watching Leonard play a dazzling first base, and he's watching Josh Gibson hit balls where no mere mortal had ever hit them. But he's also watching all of these black fans fill up his ballpark. And if I put the Negro Leagues out of business, I'm cutting off a source of my own revenue plus the risk of being ostracized by your peers to make the move. So he backed off of this. But again, the Grays were outdrawing the Washington Senators. You know, you started your career as a sports writer, and the Negro Leagues were essential not just to, you know, general cultural and economic life as a, you know, as a source of entertainment, but they were essential to the black press in the United States during the time they were running. It gave them, you know, it, it was something that was not extensively covered in the quote unquote mainstream press, mm -hmm. the white press at the time, mm -hmm. but was extensively covered in black newspapers, which were a huge business in the early part of the 20th century. And in a way, the the existence of these leagues was was essential to those newspapers operation because sports pages sell newspapers. 
Absolutely. And when you think about the formation of the Negro Leagues, it was actually, Jesse, at the urgence of the black press. They pushed for the formation of an organized body so that Negro Leagues baseball could be mirrored after Major League Baseball. And yeah, had it not been for the black press, we know very little about the Negro Leagues for the reason that you mentioned mainstream papers just simply weren't covering them. So if they weren't playing in a town that had black press, man, they were basically ignored as great as the Kansas City Monarchs were. And and we're talking about one of the greatest baseball franchises, not in black baseball history, but in baseball history. There was very little on the Monarchs in the archives of the Kansas City Star. And the Kansas City Call, the weekly newspaper, 100 years old itself, still publishes a weekly newspaper right up the street from where the Negro Leagues Museum operates. They were the voice. They were the voice. And that was the same with whether it was the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Amsterdam News. These were the voices of Negro Leagues baseball. My father grew up in Kansas City in the 1940s and 1950s and was a big baseball fan as a kid. And... I will say that the the local team at the time, the Kansas City A's, was a truly horrible team that is <laughs> essentially operated as a as a farm team for the New York Yankees, though they were a major league baseball team. So I will say, and this pains me as a native San Franciscan and a San Francisco Giants fan, and my dad died a Giants fan, but he grew up a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. It's hard for me even to say out loud, but he grew up a Dodgers fan. <laughs> And, you know, his his favorite player in the world was uh, was perhaps the greatest Dodger of them all, Jackie Robinson. But his favorite Kansas City athletic was the first baseman, Vic Power. And Vic Power. Vic Power uh, helped integrate the Kansas City A's, but was not himself African-American. He was actually Puerto Rican. No. Yes. What was the role of Afro-Latino people in the Negro Leagues, folks whose race could could be read as African American by white people of the uh-huh. early 20th century, but uh-huh. who actually represented a, a, a whole other African diaspora. Oh, well, it, it was huge. It was huge because what the Negro Leagues did, particularly for that darker skin Spanish speaking athlete, was it provided a sanctuary for them to play. Once upon a time, white Cubans could play in the major leagues, but that was really it. And so if you were of darker skin and you played baseball in this country professionally, you played in the Negro Leagues. So the Negro Leagues opened its doors to to virtually any and everyone who could play. Their only criteria was, can you play? And if you can play, you can play. And, And of course, when the Negro Leaguers, who, as I mentioned, were some of the first Americans to play in many of those Spanish speaking countries, Jesse, when they went to those countries, man, they treated like heroes. They're staying in the finest hotels. They're eating in the finest restaurants that those countries had to offer. And then you come back home and you be treated like a second-class citizen. And so a lot of Negro League players would call those Spanish-speaking countries home for one simple reason. In those countries, they weren't black baseball players. They were just baseball players. That's all they ever wanted to be. And you speak of Vic Power. Vic Power was part of the Yankees organization before he comes over to Kansas City. Vic Power was way too flamboyant for the very conservative New York Yankees. In one of my favorite stories, he goes into a restaurant, and it was a restaurant that, you know, was for white only. And Vic Power goes into the restaurant, and the lady says, well, we don't serve Negroes. Uh, and I'm sure she didn't use the word Negroes, but for this story, we'll say, we don't serve Negroes. And Vic Power, in his Puerto Rican accent, said, good, I don't eat them. (laughs) And so that was Vic Power. So he was way too outspoken, way too gregarious and flamboyant for the Yankees, but Vic Power, your father was right, was an outstanding baseball player. Vic Power could flat out play. And and I don't think he gets enough credit for how good he really was. Bob, uh, you're not a young man, but you're far from an old man. And I wonder when you were growing up, what you knew about 
the Negro Leagues and what their legacy was to you as a, you know, whatever age it is that one becomes uh-huh. really identified with sports, if, if you do become really identified with sports, like 12 yeah. or whatever. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and the thing is, Jesse, I didn't. I didn't identify. I only identified when I started volunteering with the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum going back to 1993. I considered myself to be a baseball fan. And here was this entire chapter of baseball and American history that I really did not know about. Now, I knew the name Satchel Paige, Cool Papa Bell, Josh Gibson, because those names, they trans- transcended mainstreamly. Most baseball fans have heard those names, even if they don't know how great these players were. You've heard those names. But I had no idea about the breadth, the depth, the scope, the magnitude that this league represented both on and off the field. And then I started to meet the players. And of course, one player in particular, my dear friend, the late, great John Buck O'Neill. And as I said on many occasions, once you were bitten by the Buck Bug, man, it was a wrap. You just wanted to be on Buck's team. The charisma, the passion, the commitment that he had to building an edifice where they would not be forgotten. And I do think in the final equation, that's what we all want. We want people to remember us. And Buck wanted people to remember them for what they had accomplished in this country and then to also embrace the life lessons that come from their story. Because the thing to me that shaped this story is the fact that these athletes never cried about the social injustice. They went out and did something about it. You won't let me play with you? then I'll just create a league of my own. And then my league will rise to rival your league. And when you stop to think about that, that is the American way. And so while America was trying to prevent them from sharing in the joys of her so-called national pastime, it was the American spirit that allowed them to persevere and prevail. What's not to love about this story? All baseball and all professional sports are an entertainment. I think there is a sliding scale of the extent to which a professional sport is an entertainment and the extent to which it is, I don't know, quote unquote, pure athletic competition. And there were a lot more baseball games specifically in the early part of the 20th century and going earlier uh, that were more dedicated to entertainment. You know, there were barnstorming teams where, uh, everyone wore a dress and pretended to be a woman, except for a few people who actually were women. <laughs> you know, there was there was a great legendary, one of the most successful barnstorming professional baseball teams was called the House of David, and they all pretended to yes, be observant yes. Jews. Um, and some of them were involved in an unusual <laughs> religious organization. <laughs> um, uh, but they also had a lot of ringers who just wore fake forelocks. There were all kinds of entertainments. If you went to see a a Negro League baseball game in 1930 or 1935, maybe you could describe both a a proper league game and a a barnstorming game, since they were both such big parts of how baseball players and teams made their money. What would you see and and how might it be different from what you might see at a a major league ballpark? Totally different. Negro League's baseball was, the pace of the game was just different. And Jesse, I think they understood really understood that baseball was entertainment. And that doesn't mean that you weren't going to see great fundamentally sound baseball, but man, you were going to be thoroughly entertained. Or again, as my friend Buck O'Neill would say, you couldn't go to the concession stand because you might miss something you ain't never seen before. You know, that's what they brought to the game. So the pace of the game was faster. Major League Baseball was essentially a base-to-base kind of game. So a guy got on base, you moved him over to second, and then the big hitters came up and drove him in. Nothing wrong with that. But again, the Negro Leagues would drop that bunt, and then they were going to steal second, they're going to steal third, and if you weren't too smart, they're still at home. That's the style that Jackie took with him over to the Major League, Jackie Robinson. And, and so the pace of the game was just so fast fast and and daring. And so the major leaguers would oftentimes accuse the Negro League players of showboating. Yeah, you know, so if a guy went in the hole, dove, flipped it behind his back, started to double play, 
the major leaguers would say, oh, he's showboating. They just showboating. Well, as again, my friend Buck O'Neill would say, number one, if you got something to show, show it. <laughs> and again, it's only showboating when you can't do it. And, and today it's a sports center top 10 highlight every night of the week when you see that happen. That was commonplace in the Negro Leagues. And, and so, yeah, the styles were different. Fans flocked to those games because it was so exciting. You mentioned the House of David. The House of David plays a great role in the story of black baseball because they would barnstorm all over the country playing with and against Negro League teams, most notably our Kansas City Monarchs. And, and Jesse, one of my favorite stories associated with the House of David, and, and for those, I know you mentioned them and kind of gave a little bit, but for those who might not know who the House of David, House of David was a religious sect based out of Benton Harbor, Michigan, who were typically characterized by their very long hair and very long whiskers. Well, they're mimicking David from the Bible. And so they did use baseball to spread their gospel. But as I mentioned, they play a great role in black baseball because they barnstorm regularly with Negro League teams. And so in 1934, the Denver Post Tournament becomes the first organized baseball tournament to integrate. And the House of David would recruit the legendary Leroy Satchel Page to pitch for them. Now, legend has it that Satchel wanting to look like his white teammates. And I tell people all the time, you can't make this stuff up. It's too good. Satchel wanting to look like his white teammates put on a wig and a fake red beard and would strike out some 51 hitters in three games. The House of David would win the $7,500 prize money for winning the tournament. And you can rest assured that Satchel got a large percentage of that $7,500 prize money. It's one of my favorite stories because it's so indicative of the showmanship of Satchel, but also the tremendous talent of Satchel. And, and the House of David would actually tour with the Monarchs. When the Monarchs introduced night baseball in 1930, the Monarchs and the House of David took night baseball all the way out to Seattle. This is five years before the Major Leagues ever had a night game. Yeah, the Major Leagues played their first night game in 1935. The Kansas City Monarchs introduced night baseball in 1930, and, and by the time they played that game in Cincinnati in the major leagues, the Monarchs and the House of David had gone all the way out to Seattle with night baseball. If you're playing professional baseball and you're black in Kansas City or in Chicago, there is a world of african-american business infrastructure to support your life there or your visit there right like if you go into pittsburgh there's a restaurant for you to eat at and a hotel for you to stay at and so on and so forth but if you're playing a few games in between your <laughs> scheduled dates in kansas city and chicago and you're in springfield illinois or whatever was that always the case yeah, it was challenging for them. And so their challenges didn't come on the baseball field. The baseball field, in many respects, Jesse, was their sanctuary. Their challenges came as they were traveling the highways and byways of this country, you know, not knowing where you could get, stop and get something to eat or have a place to stay. And the, the irony of this is that they would ride into a town, fill up the ballpark, and yet not be able to get a meal from the same fans who had just cheered them or not have a place to stay. So they slept on the bus and would eat their peanut butter and crackers until they get, could get to a place that offered them basic services. But the thing that I share with my guest is what you have to admire about the spirit of the Negro Leagues is they never allow that to kill their love of the game. Baseball kind of became that place where they could get away from that. But when they're playing in Major League Stadium, they couldn't use the locker room. They, they couldn't take a shower. You know, those are the kinds of hardships. And, and one of the great quotes from uh, my late friend, John Mule Mile, and my, my dear friend, Lauren Meyer, who's a filmmaker, has a wonderful film called The Other Boys of Summer. And in the film, she interviewed John Mule Mile. And as he says, I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining. Yeah, because I want you to know what it was like. I'm not complaining about it. We dealt with it. We did what we had to do, but I do want you to know what life was like. More with Bob Kendrick after the break. Stay with us. It's Bullseye 
from MaximumFun.org and NPR. Hi, I'm Allie Gertz. And I'm Julia Prescott. And we host Round Round Springfield. Springfield. Round Springfield is a new Simpsons podcast that is Simpsons adjacent. Mm -hmm. Um, In its topic, we talk to Simpsons writers, directors, voiceover actors, you name it, about non-Simpsons things that they've done. Because, surprise, they're all extremely talented. Absolutely. For example, David X. Cohen worked on The Simpsons, but then created a little show called Futurama. Mm -hmm. That's our very first episode. So tune in for stuff like that with Yardley Smith, with Tim Long, with different writers and voice actors. It's going to be so much fun. And we are every other week on MaximumFun.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Back in the day, as Netflix began to gain popularity, its rival Blockbuster was looking for an edge. At one point, the investors were asking Blockbuster (laughs) to sell jeans in the store. Yeah, you just imagine these like older investors being like, you know what the kids want? They want jeans. You get a Tom Cruise movie and some stonewashed jeans. The downfall of Blockbuster and the rise of Netflix. Listen to It's Been a Minute from NPR. Welcome back to Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest is Bob Kendrick. He's the president of the Negro League Baseball Museum, one of the only institutions in the world dedicated to telling the story of the Negro Leagues. Let's get back to our conversation. I've always found that the life of a professional athlete is inherently tragic because if we're lucky, we live to be 75 or 85 years old. But there are few who can maintain professional level athletic skills beyond their 30s. What was it like for Negro League players who were dealing with the fact that they were re-entering quote-unquote normal life, burdened both by racism and its attendant laws and structures in the United States, and the fact that many of didn't have skills other than sports. You know, they hadn't gone to college. Some some had. Uh, well, so some but, had. And, and, you know, one of the one of the interesting the facts about the Negro Leagues, and I'm so glad you mentioned that, is that some 40% of the athletes who played in the Negro Leagues had some level of college education. Less than 5% of those who played in the Major Leagues had any college education for the simple reason that the major leagues, Jesse, didn't want you to go to college then. They got you right out of high school if you went to high school. They got you right out of high school, put you in that farm system, and then you work your way to the big leagues. Well, the Negro Leagues didn't have that kind of sophisticated farm systems. So what did they do? They trained on the campuses of historically black college and universities. And then they would play the black college baseball teams, and then they recruited a great deal of their workforce from those HBCUs. So they actually had a disproportionate number of college-educated athletes in comparison to the major leagues. But you're right. When you're talking about a post-sports career, and I think this is for any athlete, that transition into normal life is never easy because they miss the adulation as well. You have to remember they were stars. They were stars in their own communities. Yeah, but they were stars. And as Buck would say, when they went to the restaurant, you're going to get the finest table. The waitress is going to give you the best service, you know, just as it is today. And so when you're transitioning away from the limelight, so to speak, and into a realm of just normalcy, you know, you become one of us normal working class citizen because none of them made enough money where they would just be institutional or wealthy after their playing careers. So they did transition in. Now, some became scouts in our sport. Uh, Buck O'Neill would transition into the major leagues as a scout, became the major's first black coach, but not a whole lot of them. So some became school teachers and educators. Others went into doing work. Cool Papa Bell, you know, and some guys were janitors, you know, later on in their lives, just trying to, again, take care of their families. I think in many people's imagination, the Negro Leagues ended with the integration of Major League Baseball in 1947. That's not the case. Uh, They continued for more than a decade after that. What was it like for the players who were great players, perhaps were for whatever reason not Willie Mays or Hank Aaron Uh, or Monty Irvin, players who got the opportunity to play in the major leagues after baseball integrated, but were still great players when 
Major League Baseball started to block the Negro League's shine and when the Negro Leagues I- I eventually folded. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right. See, that transition took 12 years, you know, before every Major League team had at least one black baseball player. Boston, the last team to integrate when they signed Pompsey Green in 1959. So it was a very slow, meticulous process as it related to bringing black players in. Now, the only exception really, really was the Brooklyn Dodgers. Branch Rickey was very aggressive signing black talent. The rest of the major leagues kind of came along, you know, it was kind of like Johnny come lately. They were very slow. And so basically you bring a player up and then eventually you bring another player so that that player wouldn't be so terribly isolated. But it wasn't as if Jackie breaks the color barrier and black folks just ran on into the major leagues. And, and there were a lot of Negro League players who did not get the opportunity. Yeah, they didn't have like a big tryout where all the African-American no. professional baseball players got to come no. by and they, uh -uh. they got drafted onto major league teams. There were major league teams that still had one or two black players in the early 1960s. Oh, absolutely. And teams like Boston, who was the last, could have had their pick of the litter of star black talent and passed on them because they really didn't want a black player. You know, they were the last because they ultimately felt like, okay, everybody else got one. I better get one now too. And that was really the case with the American League by and large. The National League was far more aggressive signing black players, which is also one of the reasons why the pendulum of power shifted to the National League. But that really good Negro League player most of them, though, Jesse, were past their prime. You know, the superstars of the Negro Leagues really were past their prime. I tell people all the time, the Major Leagues got some really good players who became great players. Mays and Aaron and Ernie Banks and Roy Campanella, guys like that. They get Monty Irvin. Monty Irvin is 30 when he comes over to join the New York Giants. And, and he still has a really good career at 30. But man, if they get Monty Irvin when he was 20 or 21 years old, there was nothing that he couldn't do. You know, Monty Irvin had been kind of tabbed the guy to be the first. He was ahead of Jackie. And really, the Negro League owners, if someone was going to break the color barrier, they wanted it to be Monty Irvin. But Monty Irvin had the same pedigree that Jackie Robinson had. You know, Monty Irvin was college educated, had served in the military, was married, stable, good-looking guy. So he had star quality written all over him. And he was a better baseball player than Jackie Robinson was at that time. Monty Irvin was a superstar for the Newark Eagles. Uh huh. Baseball was Jackie's weakest sport, which again tells you how talented Jackie Robinson was because he becomes a Hall of Fame caliber baseball player. So there were other guys in the Negro Leagues who were better baseball players than Jackie Robinson. But that, that really good Negro Leaguer didn't get a chance. And then the other superstar guys were too old. You know, you get Satchel when he was reportedly 42 years old. He was likely 52 at that time because most who knew Satchel believed that he was at least 10 years older than what he claimed to be. And only Bill Veck would have given Satchel an opportunity. But some of the other guys from the Negro Leagues, they just didn't get a fair shake. You know, a guy like a Ray Dandridge, who was a tremendous player in the Negro Leagues, well, when he he gets up to the Minneapolis Millers, and the Minneapolis Millers were the New York Giants AAA team. Well, Dandridge is named MVP of the Millers when he was almost 38 years old. You know as well as I do. They were not going to take a 38-year-old black man to take a young white kid's job. It wasn't going to happen. I don't care how good he was. And so, yes, he was bitter about it because he was play, out playing all these young kids and there was no realistic chance for him to get there. Satchel Page is maybe the single most legendary <laughs> uh, Negro Leagues baseball player, one of the most legendary baseball players in any league. And he's an interesting case to me because... There's besides him simply having a record of extraordinary performance, particularly when he was younger as a barnstorming player and in the Negro Leagues. There's these two really interesting facets to him as a guy. One is he had extraordinary success in the major leagues as a middle-aged man. 
But there's this other thing about him that I think is really interesting, which is as extraordinary as he is as a player, he's perhaps even more extraordinary as a story. Like he obviously understood his brand and, you know, he was getting a cut of the gate (laughs) and he knew how to make his, his life into a story and was one of the most, you know, no pun intended, colorful baseball players who's, who's ever played, (laughs) maybe the most. Right. And that seems to me like it is reflective of a two-sided coin, which is on the one hand, there is no doubt that in the Negro Leagues, they were playing a more entertaining form of baseball that was more fun and more exciting, right? On the other hand, because the Satchel Page could strike somebody out with his hat on his foot, throwing it backwards through his legs, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> like, uh, because these guys could do anything. But those stories, as amazing as they are, I think in part became the story of the Negro Leagues and can mm-hmm. and run the risk of diminishing the quality of play mm-hmm. and the the extraordinary qualities of the of the business and its significance in American history. And also in some cases reinforcing negative stereotypes that mm-hmm. white people have propagated about people of color through American history, certainly, you know, the like all smoke, no fire or whatever. Um, showboating and so on and so forth. And that's why Jackie had to be the first guy. And again, that doesn't mean that the others that couldn't have done it, but this was so much more than about baseball ability. And for everything that you just mentioned, Jackie defied the stereotypical depiction of African-American athletes. Satchel could have been the first. And Buck O'Neill always believed because Satchel was such a big star, white folks knew who Satchel Page was, that he would not have gone through as much of the racial hatred that Jackie went through. But there's also too great of a risk that a pitcher could fail. And then, of course, Satchel's age and the showmanship and flamboyancy of Satchel Page too closely adhered to that stereotypical depiction of those black athletes. And here comes Jackie Robinson, who is polar opposite. Yeah, Jackie Robinson is, you know, had some cachet surrounding him because he had been an All-American football player at UCLA. Uh And so he's college educated. He had served in the military. He's disciplined. He would become married to the beautiful Rachel Robinson. He is stable. And so when Jackie Robinson walks into that dugout with the Brooklyn Dodgers, hell, he might have been the most intellectual being in that dugout. And so many of these Southern-born ball players who were in the major leagues, they were seeing a black man up close and personal for the first time, and he's nothing like I heard they were. And, and so, yeah, that was so important in this equation. It really was. And, and so, you know, in many respects, Satchel was the Negro Leagues. He was the Negro League's biggest star. Uh-huh. But you couldn't take Satchel. And and that's why Branch Rickey very shrewdly chose Jackie Robinson. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest is Bob Kendrick. Bob is the president of the Negro League Baseball Museum. I, I just wanted to give you a heads up that we aren't recording our guests in studios these days for obvious reasons. Bob recorded this interview himself from his home in Kansas City. And at about this point in the interview, Bob's recording equipment stopped working. Now, luckily, we had a backup recording of him talking to us via phone. So the rest of the interview will sound like him on the phone because uh, that's what we have a recording of. Bob, I think often the integration of Major League Baseball is told as a almost like a founding myth of Americana, that it is a triumph of the spirit of America and... Uh, as it's often told, it's a triumph of uh, all the young white people like my dad who were rooting for Jackie Robinson and of Branch Rickey and, uh, 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 you know, an older white guy who was looking for a competitive and financial advantage and maybe was also fine with the social justice implications and, uh, and uh, you know, and a player who was both an extraordinary player and an extra, uh, by all accounts, an extraordinary human being, and fulfilled the role, the singular role of uh, that was asked of him to be a, a credit to his race. 
um, in, in quotes. But there is also the reality that when that happened, uh, it's not like <laughs> when they started adding uh, black baseball players to the Major League Baseball, they started adding white baseball players to the Negro Leagues, or they started adding black owners to Major League Baseball. Um, so what did we lose when Major League Baseball integrated and as the Negro Leagues faded and, and eventually closed up shop in the late 1950s? Well, I, I'll be honest. I don't know if the African-American community realized what it was losing when it lost the Negro Leagues. Because, Jesse, wherever you had successful black baseball, you had thriving black economies. And so what was good for the soul of our country, what was good morally, what was good socially, was devastating economically. And, and so when we lost the Negro Leagues, we lost that catalyst that was that spark for a, a thriving economy. And and I don't know if we realize that. And, and in the final equation, we ask for integration. <laughs> what we wanted was equality. And, and, and we're still fighting for equality today. And so, yes, that was absolutely, you know, I reference it as a bittersweet story. Because there's no question that, that this changed things dramatically in our society. And we do make the bold assertion that Jackie's breaking of the color barrier wasn't just a part of the civil rights movement. It actually was the beginning of the civil rights movement. As you well know, that's 1947. That is well before those noted civil rights occurrences. That's before Brown versus the Board of Education. And that's before Rosa Parks' refusal to move to the back of the bus. As my friend Buck O'Neill would so eloquently say, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was only a sophomore at Morehouse College when Robinson signed his contract to play in the Dodgers organization. President Truman would not integrate the armed forces until a year after Jackie. So for all intents and purposes, this is what indeed started the ball of social progress rolling in this country. That spawned integration in our society. And once this our society became integrated, those smaller Black-owned businesses could no longer compete. And, and sad to say, Black folks then went to these businesses that once upon a time would not allow them in. To think about this, a woman could go into a store, and if she touched a hat, she had to buy it. That hat was now permanently stained. And, and so now, all of a sudden, you could go in, and, and, and so you know, that's a whole nother sociological kind of issue, which is way too sophisticated for my country boy feeble mind. So, yeah, there was a lot lost when we did lose the Negro Leagues. But again, it moved our country in ways in which I don't think we ever fathom possible from a social standpoint. Bob, we have to go, but I, I just wanted to mention to you that um, uh I mentioned to you that my father was from Kansas City, and I... Sorry. No, 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 I understand. He passed away relatively recently, and when I went up to my hometown where I was, I was born, San Francisco, to his house to take him with my stepmother into hospice, and when I was leaving to drive back to L.A., I looked around his room, and I thought, is there anything here that he saved that I wanted to take home with me? And he and I and my brother had gone on a, <laughs> he inherited some money so that he could buy a two-year-old car, which was the first car we'd ever had that worked. And we decided to take a long driving trip from San Francisco one summer and we decided to go to as many baseball games as we could and our goal was to drive from san francisco all the way to kansas city where my father where my father lived as a child and was born and um it was a long and difficult trip um but also was an amazing trip and when we got to kansas city one of the places we went was the negro leagues baseball museum 
and it had just recently opened at that time. I think this was 1994 or five. Uh-huh. And I got to meet Buck O'Neill briefly. He was just around. <laughs> Look that. He would do that. He'd just come hang around. Um, you know, to shake his hand. And um, sitting next to my dad's bed when I when I was looking around at this room that, that wouldn't that he would not occupy again was a a little souvenir baseball bat from from that trip to the museum that he had saved for those tw now 25, 26 years. And it was one of a couple of things that I brought home with me to my house. And um, uh, I just, I wanted to thank you for that, uh, for that experience. You were already involved in the museum at the time, though you, were, you, you weren't working there uh, for money yet. Um, and, and thank you for, stewarding this uh, wonderful place and this amazing American story. Um, I, I really appreciate it. And it, it has a lot of, a lot of meaning to me personally. So thank you. No, well, it's, it's an honor for me to do this work. Uh, it is absolutely a labor of love, not only for me, but I think our entire team. And, and, and I think the thing, Jesse, that is not lost on any of us, and, and, and this is kind of what drives and motivates us, is that we have an opportunity to leave a legacy. Uh, we understand that this museum is so much bigger than any of us, and that if we do our work properly, we have an opportunity to secure its future so that it will be here for future generations to enjoy. And I think any time that you can leave a legacy in this world, that is something that is so meaningful. Um, and, and so, you know, every day it's, it's, we're motivated to keep the legacy of these legendary and courageous athletes alive. And, and, and it's an honor to be able to do this work. Bob, I'm sure that you wish you could be welcoming more people through your doors during the, the centennial of the Negro Leagues and that more of the celebrations that you had planned in partnership with Major League Baseball could take place this year, given given the way that the pandemic has affected going to things, including baseball games and museums, although your museum is open uh, for visitors uh, now in a relatively limited way. But I hope that some of those centennial activities can become centennial in one activities yes. next year. <laughs> Absolutely. We've already come up with the concept of Negro Leagues 101. And, and for those who have stepped foot on a college campus, those 101 classes were the only ones I passed. So uh, we're going to use a, create an educational initiative that will kind of carry and drive next year's celebration as, as we keep create a continuum uh, of things that we weren't able to get done this year. Certainly doesn't diminish the fact that this is still a milestone year and the launching of our Tip Your Cap to the Negro Leagues campaign really gave a boost to this milestone celebration this year. You know, this virtual campaign, it just really took off. And it was a crazy idea that I had that after we couldn't do our National Day of Recognition with Major League Baseball, where all 30 teams were going to honor the Negro Leagues and, and essentially do an in-stadium Tip Your Cap with fans and, and players. And as you well know in our sport, there's nothing more honorable that a ball player can do than a simple tip of the cap. It is the ultimate show of respect. And, and so I came up with this notion to do a virtual tip of the cap. Could we get fans, perhaps a few players, current and former, to take a picture or video of themselves tipping their cap in honor of the Negro Leagues? Well, little did I know that it would go viral. And when we launched this campaign on June 29th of this year, we launched it with four U.S. presidents tipping their cap, President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton, President Jimmy Carter. And then we even, Jesse, went into outer space and got a literally out-of-worldly tip of the cap from astronaut Chris Cassidy, who was aboard the International Space Shuttle when he tipped his cap. I think at that point we realized we had something pretty doggone special here, and that effort is still continuing, and so we're keeping the Tip Your Cap campaign going certainly through at least August 16th. But with the popularity of this, uh, we're likely to keep it going through the end of the centennial year. And for those who might be interested in tipping their cap, 
you can upload a photograph of yourself or a short video, you know, to our photos at tippingyourcap.com. And then the website, if you want to go on and look at these amazing folks who have tipped their cap in honor of the Negro Leagues, the website is at www.tippingyourcap.com. And I was excited because most recently we got a, uh, a hat tip from the Temptations, the Motown Temptations. So this thing has just been amazing. Well, Bob, I sure appreciate you taking all this time. Uh, it was great, great to get to talk to you about the museum and the history of the Negro Leagues. Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for having me. Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro League Baseball Museum. If you're in the area and you're in a position to visit, the museum is open for a few folks to look around safely. You can also donate to the museum by going to its website, nlbm.com. It's been tough for this incredible museum to lose their 100th anniversary of the Negro League's year, uh, and your financial support makes a big difference. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is produced out of the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around greater Los Angeles, California, where, as of this recording, the Giants are 6-7 and seven and the Dodgers are 9-4. and four. But the Giants are fundamentally good and the Dodgers are fundamentally evil. The show is produced by speaking into microphones, one of which I have and none of which my Dodgers fan colleagues have. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson, Dodgers, Jesus Ambrosio, Dodgers, and Jordan Cowling, uh, who was a Phillies fan until the Philly fanatic made her drop her hot dog and didn't replace it and became a Dodgers fan. There are our associate producers. We get help from Casey O'Brien, who is blessedly neutral in this eternal battle. He's a Twins fan, and I think we can all agree on Twins utility catcher, Williams Astadillo. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. Our theme song is by The Go Team, thanks to them and their label Memphis Industries for letting us use it. You can keep up with the show on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. And by the way, rest in peace to Bay Area sports radio legend Ralph Razor Voice Barbieri, uh, whose own signature sign-off was the inspiration for my somewhat glib one. He always ended his shows by saying, with a little bit of a wink, remember that angels fly because they take themselves lightly. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.